20 years ago. It's uh, difficult to believe that that happened 20 years ago. This was an incredible event. But since then, a number of experiences have been, uh, have been made, and time has come to exchange reflections uh, and also take lessons from uh, what uh, has been achieved and what is uh, left for the successors of those who were called to uh, contribute to the establishment of, uh, of the court. And uh, this afternoon, we have the privilege of uh, having here a number of um, uh, persons who uh, either participates, participated directly in the event or in one way or another were associated with the establishment and the functioning of the International Court of Justice. By way of introduction, but very, very briefly, a few words in addition to what you could read uh, in, in, in the program, just to make sure that you uh, understand I mean, how the participants are, are linked to the event, event of the creation of the court or the functioning of, of the court. And I will do this in uh, alphabetic order, starting with uh, uh, Cecile uh, Aptel, of whom you know that uh, she's, she's legal, uh, senior legal policy advisor to the High Commissioner for Human Rights. But at the same time, she's an academic. She's a professor at the Fletcher School and a visiting professor both at uh, Harvard University and the Geneva uh, Academy. She spent now, hard to say, but uh, more than tw 20 years uh, at the United Nations with, uh, in, in various capacities, more specifically also with the ICTR. And last year, as many of you, you, you probably know, managed the establishment of the mechanism on Syria, the international impartial independent mechanism on, on uh, Syria. And Cecile will be very soon uh, joining the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in Geneva as Director of Policy, Strategy, and Knowledge. Benjamin Charlier currently heads the ICRC's advisory service on, uh, on IHL. And by the way, I thank the ICRC for hosting us here. It's a great pleasure being at the Humanitarium. Uh, he very early on specialized in international law and criminal law. And of course, as president of the board of the academy, I will mention that he took an executive master in international law in armed conflict here at the uh, Geneva Academy. Uh, in the first phase of his uh, career, he worked in uh, Belgium in the office of the Belgian Federal uh, Prosecutor and then joined the ICRC already in 2005 in a number of uh, different positions. But here I'll simply indicate that in 2010 he joined the legal division and uh, he was in charge of the follow-up of international uh, criminal justice mechanisms, ICTY, ICTR, and ICRC in particular. And now in his capacity, he also is the ICRC's focal point for the institutional relationship between uh, ICRC and the, uh, the ICC. We have also the uh, honor and great pleasure of having with us uh, Kimberly Post. Kim, as you know, is now judge at the ICC. But she was already part of the Canadian delegation for the negotiation of the Rome Statute and its uh, rules of, uh, of procedure and, uh, and evidence. Um, then uh, later on, she became a judge at uh, ICTY uh, and sat on a number of um, uh, trials related to Srebrenica. She then became chef de cabinet to the president of the, uh, the ICC. And, um, uh, I want to mention also that you spent a few years in, in New York as ombudsperson on uh, sanctioned regimes where, uh, Kim, you achieve a, I mean, a remarkable uh, job. And last but not least, uh, Ambassador Valentin uh, Zellweger, who now is the head of the Swiss permanent mission to UNOG and uh, the other international organizations here in Geneva, has been in that position for almost two years now. And uh, prior to that, I'm not going to start from the very beginning, but he was a member of the Swiss delegation uh, to the Rome Conference in 98. So this is probably where both of you already uh, met. And then was a member of the Swiss delegation to all the ICC preparatory uh, commissions, while at least for a good part of it being a legal advisor to the Swiss mission in, uh, in, in New York. Then he immediately became the chef de cabinet of the first president of the ICC at the time when the, the court was uh, established, Philip Kirsch. And then he became 
one of my successors actually uh, in the foreign ministry as director of international law um, and juris consult, the legal uh, advisor. And uh, uh, actually, I must say that it's my former capacity as director of international law that I had the honor of uh, leading the Swiss delegation to all the ICC prepcoms and the first assembly of states parties and then in New York as legal counsel that amongst other things um, I was involved in the finalization of the uh, relationship agreement between the United Nations and the, and the court and, and of course the management of this relationship for uh, several years. So how are we now going to, uh, to proceed? In, in the preparatory phase we uh, submitted, uh, and the organizers submitted to the panelists uh, five questions. They are not expected to address each one of, of these questions, and you will definitely understand that uh, with the responsibilities they have, all of them most likely will have some institutional constraints in what they can say, or what they say, or where they will I mean, be, be cautious or have to be cautious due to uh, their respective roles. So I, I already uh, ask for your understanding when you uh, feel that a question that you might uh, want to ask is definitely an interesting question, but there are limits to what they can say um, uh, on some of these issues. Now, what are these uh, five uh, questions, quickly? The first question that we submitted to them is, what are the main positive aspects of the establishment of the ICC, as well as the performance by the court of its functions? Second question, the parallel, what are the main shortfalls in the establishment of the court and in the performance of its role? And the third question, which is closely related to the two first ones, what are the main challenges the court is facing now and how can they best be addressed? Fourth question is broader in nature. Dealing with the past requires a comprehensive approach. How does the system established by the Rome Statute perform in that respect? What are the main challenges in the interrelationship between criminal justice institutions and mechanisms devoted to fact-finding, investigation, truth-telling, restorative justice, compensation for victims, etc.? This is obviously a question that could be dealt with over a full week, mm -hmm. but uh, it's interesting to have some insights from the panelists, at least on some, some of the uh, aspects, to take the, the ICC in its broader uh, context uh, today. And the last question, if, if, if we have time, otherwise, if you're interested, you may ask it uh, yourself. How how do you, uh, uh, to the extent that you can do it, assess the role of civil society in the establishment of the court and subsequently? And um, I would like to uh, ask this question. We, we, we will take them in, in, in that order. And I will uh, invite the, the panelists to, to the extent that they are prepared to do it, they're willing to and uh, able to do it, to uh, address, to start with, uh, the first question. And I will go in the uh, alphabetic uh, order for the first question, and then uh, the second in the alphabetic order, etc. So on the question, what are the main positive aspects of the establishment of the ICC, as well as uh, of the performance by the court of its uh, function, let me start with uh, you, Cecil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it, it's a great honor to be here. And I'm actually very intimidated to answer this first question in, in the presence of, of such a, a panel. Um, but with the advantage of, of being able to start from the scratch, um, I think that one of the main achievements is the very fact that the ICC exists. I mean, it has the, the merit to exist and, and to be a, a clearly recognized international jurisdiction with a clear mandate and, and, and thereby by contributing to uh, furthering accountability for three international crimes um, that are genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And then, you know, very soon we'll also have jurisdiction of a, a fourth extremely important crime, the crime of aggression. And that would be uh, great to have, again, a forum at the international level where that crime, which we haven't seen prosecuted since Nuremberg and Tokyo, can, can again be addressed. So first and foremost, it exists. And it proves that there can be international criminal jurisdiction even outside of the ambit of the UN Security Council, which is what we had uh, seen with the ICTY and ICTR. Um, it also 
you know, in, in its still relatively short life, um, has demonstrated that all three avenues in which the ICC can be seized, which we find in the statute, namely the fact that the um, a state can refer a situation to the ICC, that's the first one, a second one being the UN Security Council being able to refer a case to the ICC, and the third one being the prosecutor taking up a case um, out of her own powers, that's a proprio motu avenue, all three have been used. So we have really have seen the statute being fully used to that extent. And it's not always easy, and, and, and I'm sure that we will come back later on to some of the challenges associated with these three different ways the ICC is seized. But again, it shows that, you know, and, and, and it, it, is, it has shown that it can be done and that all three avenues can be used and that they lead to furthering accountability. Of course, there have been a few very interesting um, issues pertaining to that. For instance, I think, and I speak under the, you know, under the guise of, of uh, really um, the scrutiny of, of, of you two, for, you three uh, being at the, uh, at, at really the, in Rome and then the following um, Assembly of State Party sessions. I don't think that it was necessarily foreseen when the Rome Statute was adopted that referral by state was going to be exclusively used in terms of state referral. I think that it was even not envisaged that it was going to be used that way. So there have been some interesting developments um, that were not necessarily foreseen, but that again show the space for accountability and the need to further accountability for those international crimes. Um, and I could go on and on, but I'll just mention one last aspect, which is key, which is the fact that the ICC not only exists, but it delivers fair trials, and it has proven that it can actually deliver uh, fair justice, respecting all due standards, respecting a fully um, public international law, including international human rights law, and that really is a, a huge milestone when we compare it to Nuremberg or Tokyo, because in fact all of those international human rights legal treaties have been adopted since and, and are certainly fully respected by the court. But also in the process, it has really developed a fascinating uh, case law, notably, and just to mention a few, a few issues on the crime of recruitment and use of children in hostilities, really pushing the agenda there, and clearly, in fact, uh, bringing more visibility to the way children are affected by armed conflict, including by being recruited and used as child soldiers. Um, and also, related to international humanitarian law, it has also really developed um, the concept of common responsibility uh, notably applying to civilians in, in ways that go beyond what had been done before. As a way to start. Thank you so much, Cecile. Benjamin? So first of all, again, uh, let me say that on behalf of the ICRC, we are very pleased to uh, provide uh, for this space uh, and, and, uh, and to uh, host you for this IHL talk. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to participate uh, to that. The nature of the exercise is uh, such that you made uh, several points that I was going to make anyway. So that will make my presentation uh, or comments a bit uh, easier. So yes, t today uh, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the ICC. Last year we celebrated uh, the 40th anniversary of the, Gen of the additional protocols to the Geneva Convention. Uh, this year marks also uh, the 150th anniversary of the St. Petersburg uh, Declaration, uh, the 10th anniversary of the Cluster uh, Munition Convention, and next year will be the 70th anniversary of the Geneva Convention. So it's a pretty interesting period, uh, I would say, uh, to reflect on and, and take stock of uh, the achievements and challenges of a number of um, international mechanisms, let's say, uh, and, to, and to consider the, the way forward. Before uh, addressing specifically what uh, I see as, a, as the main uh, contribution of the ICC in relation to IHL-related aspects, um, this is also an opportunity for me on behalf of the ICRC as an introduction, if you allow me, uh, to clarify a number of points directly linked to the way the ICRC's work is linked uh, to the work of the ICRC and the, and the, and the separation uh, be, be between the, the two, because it will inform also the, the way we, 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 we comment on those uh, subjects. So um, one could say, uh, to sum up somehow, that if you see the ICRC as the humanitarian arm, let's say, of IHL, um, to sum it up, you could consider that uh, the ICC, international uh, tribunals, but also domestic uh, tribunals and courts uh, constitute, let's say, the, 
the, the, the bras armé or the, or the weapon of, uh, of IHL in terms of uh, uh, voilà, en enforcing um, implementation of, of IHL. So somehow, obviously, it's a surprise to no one that uh, the set of values that uh, under pin the work of both organizations is, uh, is similar. But nevertheless, as you most probably all know uh, also, the nature of the work for the ICRC being purely humanitarian nature, uh, in nature, for the ICC being a judicial body, uh, makes it also very separate somehow. Um, and it's also, it's always uh, important to remind that as an institutional position somehow the ICRC is very supportive of uh, the establishment of uh, all mechanisms that uh, uh, will help uh, enforcing the compliance with IHL. Um, this specific nature of the mandate that was given to the ICRC and the ICC by the community of states uh, make it so that the ICRC does not participate in the concrete work of the uh, ICC or other tribunals. Uh, so to put it bluntly, we, we, as most of you know, we do not participate in the individual criminal proceeding as auxiliary of, of, of justice. So that's the, 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 the overall point. In relation to the, the achievement, I listed uh, mainly three. Uh, the first of which I will go pretty quickly about because it's indeed the fact that the court exists and that in itself it's an achievement. Now we have a, a permanent judicial body that's, that is able to actually perform judicial tasks in, in, in relation to uh, and applying individual criminal responsibility to uh, perpetrators or alleged perpetrators of the most serious violations of IHL. Um, I... As a matter of fact, actually, uh, the ICRC back in 1949, uh, during the negotiations of the, the Geneva Conventions, uh, already expressed its interest in setting up some sort of an international mechanism that would have a global uh, mandate. So if at that time it was possibly politically a bit premature, um, the ICRC strongly supported uh, the, the negotiation process uh, 50, uh, yeah, well, uh, at the, uh, 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 in, in Rome, uh, sorry, uh, and without participating to the political debates and the intergovernmental process, nevertheless provided its technical expertise to the drafters to namely ensure that uh, you know, provisions in relation to uh, war crimes would be in line with what the ICRC was seeing at the time as, uh, as uh, the reflection of uh, customary international law. So this is the first uh, achievement. The second achievement, which I have no doubt we will uh, debate a lot about and is both, in my opinion, uh, an achievement but also possibly a challenge, is the notion of complementarity, which I don't have to recall to uh, all of you. Uh, the, 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 the principle of complementarity somehow um, set up in the Rome Statute is a strong complement to the system uh, that is already uh, that was already established by the, by the Geneva Conventions, uh, namely that uh, the prime responsibility of addressing the issue of impunity uh, lies with states. Um, and the fact that it's been crystallized in the Rome Statute from our experience uh, in, the, uh, in the ICRC, I, I, I must say, has definitely and genuinely acted as an incentive for states to take up their responsibilities. It, 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 it definitely has acted as a catalyst for a number of states to, act, to, to get into it, roll up their sleeves, and, uh, and either by way of the Rome Statute itself or by realizing that indeed um, there was work to do at national level to give uh, effect to that, uh, to that principle. Um, so I could give you uh, possibly later on a, a number of figures uh, that, uh, that, 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 that translates that ID, that states have been receptive to that, to that ID. But uh, the third, let's say, uh, positive aspect of the, of the Rome Statute that I see is 
um, at least the potential of participating to the clarification of uh, important IHL related concepts. Uh, and I see that in, in, in two ways. First of all, as we all know, the Rome Statute was the, the first um, exercise to codify in, in, in one single statute, um, the, at the time, what was partly seen at least as the, as the current state of uh, international, uh, customer international humanitarian law. So that in itself was, was really important. And we might be discussing later on whether this work was complete, if there is still room for improvement. But the fact that it exists is, is, uh, is important. Um, and then obviously the potential that the court has in, in the course of its upcoming work uh, to indeed clarify a number of IHL related concepts in its decision is, um, is a major uh, element. Um, I would also say in conclusion that this potential for clarifying uh, IHL related concepts um, definitely links up with the, the work of national courts and, and, and judicial mechanism that, that will definitely uh, look up to what uh, the, the, ICRC, the ICC will, uh, will develop. So I, I could continue, uh, but I will leave the floor to other, the other panelists on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. And Kim, it's your turn. Well, thanks very much. And my thanks as well to the organizers for the invitation. It's always uh, great to have an opportunity to come and speak about the court in, in a broader perspective, especially in this 20th anniversary year. Uh, so not to duplicate uh, these, the, all of the uh, important comments that have already been made, I would start with in terms of the, the positive, and I'm very glad we're starting with the positive today. Um, so with all of its challenges, the point which has been made, the existence of the International Criminal Court is a, a huge, a positive uh, achievement. And in this year of the 20th anniversary, what I think we have to reinforce, and those of us were, who were there will remember, it is a miracle. It is a miracle that we have an international criminal court. It was a convergence of factors, political factors, uh, that brought us a window of opportunity where we could establish this court. And right up until that gavel went down, we had no idea, those of us who were there, whether we were going to achieve a compromise and achieve this court. And albeit it's got lots of issues, uh, it's a pretty good treaty. It's a pretty good treaty in terms of the jurisdiction, in terms of the relationship uh, between the court and the Security Council, in terms of the prosecutor's powers. And we, because of all the issues that are natural to the development of this court, we forget that and we can't forget that. Today, we would not be able to establish this court. And that, to me, is one of the most important things we must always focus on um, as we, we talk about uh, about the ICC. Uh, and secondly, it's a point that, uh, that has been made but needs to be emphasized. What was created 20 years ago was not a standalone court. It was a system, the Rome Statute system, which operates, as, as uh, Benjamin has mentioned, on the principle of complementarity. The court is a court of last resort, where states are unable or unwilling to prosecute. And the intention is to drive states to take up their responsibility to investigate and prosecute these, the most serious of crimes. And that is a, is a huge success, it, oh, a huge success, maybe that's an overstatement. It is a success in the sense that we do have that movement among states uh, in order to be able to, to prosecute and investigate. And we'll talk more about that, both from the positive and the negative, but it is very important that that is an achievement because what it means the Rome Statute system is possibility. Prior to the creation of this court, we had a situation basically where you had horrible atrocities. I always use the example of Idi Amin. And he lived out his life peacefully in Saudi Arabia. And for the victims, there was not even the possibility of justice. Today, even with all of the challenges, and it, it, it's not a question of possibility. It's a, it, there is a possibility. And in my view, I'm Canadian, I'm endlessly optimistic. It's a probability that there will be justice, some justice. That's a huge sea change and, a, and an accomplishment. Uh, the other uh, couple of things I would mention, uh, it's already been mentioned, we are promoting 
um, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, in national jurisdictions, in military academies, in terms of training. The court has that impact. Um, and something an American friend said to me, who works for the government recently, uh, which we don't focus on enough, in the heart of the Pentagon, very high officials are talking about the International Criminal Court. Now, maybe they're not talking about it in the nicest terms, <laughs> but the fact that they're talking about it and that it's relevant, that's an amazing accomplishment. So I, I don't think we should forget that. Um, just briefly on the, the other aspect of this, the performance of the court, because we're going to talk about some of the less than stellar, perhaps, performance aspects of the court. But there are some really good performance um, aspects. If you think about, when I think about the ICT, versus the ICC. ICTY, one situation, um, you know, a tremendous number of cases. I think it's got a great legacy. This court has multiple situations all over the world, so every single case involves reinventing everything that goes into these investigations. So in a 20-year period, 15 really um, operationally, and even less than that actually, to have had the prosecutor currently has 10 preliminary examinations, 10 situations uh, under investigation, 26 cases, um, three convictions, an acquittal, um, ongoing, three ongoing trials, appeals. That's a pretty good accomplishment given the scope that this court has to, uh, has to deal with. Um, and the other thing, um, the reparation system. This is a, a new phase for international criminal justice because it is a court that has reparations, participation by victims, and the court is currently engaged in a number of cases. I'm assigned in trial division to the reparations phase uh, of the Bemba case. So th that's a, a huge area in terms of restorative justice for victims. And I don't think we can lose sight of those uh, positive aspects. So I'll stop there for the moment. Thank you so much, Kim uh, Valentin. Benjamin uh, started, was the second speaker, and he started his uh, presentation by saying it's not easy to come up with new ideas. So you could imagine for the fourth speaker that it's, not, uh, it's even a bit less uh, easy. And I would like to make exactly the same point that was made by all previous speakers the main achievement of this court is its existence. And not only because it was a long time in the making, and uh, Benjamin has alluded to it, um, if you, there is a very interesting fact. If you look at Article 6 of the Genocide Convention that was adopted in uh, 1949, it's a convention, international convention that is in force that alludes to an institution that was not there for 50 years. It speaks about an international tribunal. So it shows you that there was another window of opportunity after the Second World War where people thought things are possible, and a lot was possible. We got the Geneva Conventions, we got the beginning of the human rights the uh, negotiations that led to the declaration, and then in 66 to the covenant and, and the rest. But it took us 50 years. And we all know the circumstances why, in the end, it was possible to create the court. And it's extremely important to emphasize that the court stands also for another paradigm, not only for accountability, but also for the fact that it's not meant to be a single institution. It's meant, and it has been mentioned, it's meant to be part of a whole system and to be a top system. And if you look at the whole um, discussion since um, 98, whatever we may say and will say about the court, accountability is not going to go away because it has so many footholds now in national legislations. Um, it also has a proliferation of international mechanisms that we did not foresee in 98, and perhaps we will come back to that. But the idea of ac accountability is there. And why is this so important? We should remember that accountability has one of the most important of its functions is prevention. And at the time when here in Geneva we speak so much about prevention, we know that this is utmost on the agenda of the uh, UN Secretary General, we should speak again, speak more about accountability and about institutions like the ICC. We also think that uh, institutions like the Human Rights Council has a contribution to make to prevention because it's an early indicator of coming um, 
possible conflict, potential conflicts. But the ICC certainly is an instrument, and the whole system is an instrument of prevention if it works. And therefore, if we look at the ICC, and you just mentioned, Kim, the different cases, I think we should also include the cases in before national courts. Uh, I just give you one example. Um, there were prosecutions in the UK under the ICC uh, implementation statute against UK soldiers in Iraq. Now that is a very important uh, development and it's exactly the way it should be. It's the states who should do it. And Probably we only get the full picture of what has happened since 98 if we look even at all levels of implementation. A second point I would like to make, which is perhaps also sometimes overlooked, but is closely tied to the, IC, uh, the, the, the question of IHL. The ICC criminalizes individual behavior. It individualizes international legal obligations. It's no longer like in the Geneva Conventions, a state that then has to find ways to do that. It's an individual. And therefore, it's like a new approach to really target individuals. And that has several consequences. The first consequence is that this difficult distinction we make in IHL between state actors and non-state armed actors no longer holds. It's about the crime. You look at the statute and the elements of crime, you see the definition of the elements of the crime, and if that is given, it's immaterial whether you wore a uniform or not. You're just liable to be punished. So one of the big challenges we have in certainly NIAC, non-international armed conflict, to get at the non-state actors and to have them apply international humanitarian law in the ICC statute, you get it for free because it's about individuals. And the third point that has not yet been mentioned, and I'd like to mention it because I do think that uh, it's extremely important, is the role of vict victims. For the first time, an important international institution has recognized the role of victims. And in the end, it is about them. And the victims in the court, as we know, have a role in, uh, they can participate in the proceedings, and there is a possibility for them to get reparations, which is a full recognition of their plight. Now, we all know that um, they prove to be more difficult to, if you allow me the word, to conceptualize, to legalize the system, the, the, the concept, who is a victim, etc. But it's the fact that victims are part of the proceedings. And I think that's extremely important. And it should also be an indication as, as a governance model for other organizations. All too often, we speak about people who have no voice in our work. And in the ICC, victims were given a voice and victims were given a role. And I think that is a very important achievement in itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentin. Now, uh, we have to keep in mind all these huge uh, achievements, but of course we don't want only to celebrate, but also to take lessons and to look forward. But before going to that, we sh should always keep in mind how many millions of victims it took for these tribunals to be established. If you, if, if you take Nuremberg and Tokyo, then if, if you take the genocide convention you alluded to, why was the International Criminal Court mentioned in this, uh, in this convention? Uh, it took uh, Yugoslavia and then Rwanda for people to say, now is the time to create a court for the future, a general one based on a treaty and not on a Security Council resolution. And, and we, we have to keep that in mind. So what, what it took, a huge, a huge effort. There is a risk for the next generation to consider uh, these tribunals as, as, as a given. And uh, I mean, this, the beginning of this new culture is by no way a given. 
And so let's now keep that in mind when we come also to recognizing some of the shortfalls and the challenges that this new culture is, is, is facing. May I in invite the panelists to be rather short on question two, the main shortfalls, because then we, we want to address the main challenges. And then, I mean, we are very close to this. So on the shortfalls, if, if you could just simply be, please mention them, and we'll be able to further elaborate under the, the aspect of challenges and, 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 and the future. So on the issue of the shortfalls, if I start now with uh, Benjamin, would you be ready to start? To go straight to the point, I would say that from, again, uh, the, the perspective uh, of uh, an organization like the ICRC, uh, the, the main shortfall that we would want to comment on is the, 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 the actual substance, the, the actual substance of uh, Article 8. Uh, of, uh, of the statute. So at the time, during the negotiation process, the ICRC was very pleased to see, as I said before, that uh, you know, a, a list of war crimes uh, was being codified, um, in particular that uh, a substantial part of uh, you know, that article was concerning NIACs, which was a, a, a big achievement. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we also took note at the time that uh, the list was not as comprehensive as one could have hoped um, overall. Um, we all know that uh, since uh, 1998 uh, amendments to our Article 8 uh, have been uh, adopted, uh, namely in the field of uh, criminalizing, criminalizing the, the use of certain weapons, which is uh, voilà, uh, uh, an, an important uh, step forward. Um, but the fact remains that somehow uh, there is still room for improvement and, 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 and room for work uh, to, to be done in order to, at the end of the day, finding ourselves in a position where the list of war crimes that, that is included in the Rome Statute is fully harmonized with, with at, at least the perspective that the ICRC has on the current state of customary international uh, humanitarian law. So we know that there are a number of initiatives that are still ongoing, um, but I think that it's important for the overall protection of victims of armed conflict that, that, that this effort be done. And the, 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 there is really no objective reason to consider that uh, you know, victims of, uh, uh, of violations in a context of international armed conflict should be less protected that, uh, for, for the same acts uh, that victims uh, finding themselves in a situation of non-international armed conflict. So objectively speaking, there's probably still a, a, a bit of work to do. Um, and, uh, and this is the only aspect that I would comment on uh, at, at this point. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'll just go through, uh, because we're going to discuss some more on the challenges, but some of the obvious um, big picture challenges for the, for the court and shortfalls. One that is a shortfall a challenge, uh, perhaps the, the biggest issue, the, the question of jurisdiction of the court. Um, as, it, as it is a treaty-based body, there was no other option. It's not it, like it was a mistake, but the reality is we have 123 states parties to the Rome Statute. It does not cover all states, and that is a source of many problems in terms of the credibility of the court, in terms of the question that is continually asked, why cases in Africa, why not in Syria? What about Yemen, Myanmar? It, we all know the, the cases uh, and the questions that arise, and it all comes down to fundamentally the issue is the universal application and non-universal application of the Rome Statute. And that has to, that it continues to be a major challenge for the court and how, how we address it. We can, we can talk more about that. Um, I worked on part nine of the Rome Statute, which is the cooperation part. It is a brilliant it is a brilliant um, part of the statute, uh, but some of the assumptions on which it was drafted uh, have proven not to be true, and, and we can talk a bit more about that. But the lack of state cooperation is clearly uh, a major uh, problem for the court. We have 14, I might, might be up to 15 now, outstanding arrest warrants. Uh, we all know the, the scenarios um, that, that uh, the court faces in terms of cooperation. Uh, and it's also just a day-to-day -day problem in terms of getting that evidence gathering cooperation. So 
issues uh, that have to be addressed there, including the very complex uh, immunities question, which is, of course, sub judicia at the moment before the court. But I'll have a little bit to say about it uh, if we get a chance uh, on that. Uh, and one that I would highlight again amongst big picture issues, I think this is one of the major, major um, setbacks in terms of the last 20 years. We have not paid any significant attention to the complementarity principle. We have not focused, we, the international community, on building up national capacity in order to allow for this principle to be really fulfilled. And we've created ridiculous expectations that this court can bring justice to all these situations and the massive number of cases that arise from them. And there, if there's something that has to be addressed in the coming period, it's we've got to work on uh, capacity building and, and complementarity. Uh, just a few performance um, uh, setbacks. I mean, and I'll speak, there's lots of issues. Madam Prosecutor has probably the hardest job in the world, so I won't address uh, the prosecutor's challenges. But just a couple for the judiciary. Uh, the court is criticized and properly criticized for the delay and length of proceedings, and that remains a huge challenge. And for the efficiency of those proceedings, we must demonstrate we can run efficient uh, and fair trials. Um, and the efficiency is not inconsistent with fairness. And we need some consistency. I'm afraid we ran out of time in Rome to on working on the procedures, all of these procedural geeks as we were. Uh, we couldn't agree on a lot of the procedures and have left it to the, to the judges. And one of the setbacks is that almost every case, they're reinventing the whole process for the proceedings. And that has to change. Um, so that's one of the uh, other issues that I would highlight. Thank you very much. I have exactly the same three uh, issues, and I will be very short on that. The limited jurisdiction, why is it such a problem? Because it does create a perception of double standards. And I remember when I was traveling with the president at the beginning of the court, the fact that many big, uh, powerful states had not yet signed on or were actively opposing the court already then allowed many states to say, look, if they don't, we won't. And uh, in uh, the meantime, we had this challenge that you alluded to with a focus on African states. We all know how this focus came about. There was a saying at the court, uh, uh, the court did not go to Africa. Africa came to the court. But there is a perception that the uh, court concentrated on one continent, and that's not good. Um, and this, uh, this perception of double standards, I think, is something that does haunt the court, and it should be, there should be ways to uh, go about. We will probably come to that. We know that the court is addressing the issue already, but uh, universality certainly remains a very important uh, goal. Lack of enforcement uh, mechanisms, that has two um, negative consequences for the court, that in cases where the court is uh, active in a given situation, if the court wishes to prosecute government forces, as you could imagine, it's not so easy to get the government's cooperation on uh, those prosecutions, and we have seen this in the past, and this is something that we will have to find solutions, but then also on non-cooperating states, state parties that do not cooperate. In another sense, there were people traveling, people that had uh, were subject of an arrest warrant that were traveling uh, all over the world and even in uh, member states of the ICC, and that, of course, creates the impression of weakness. And therefore, we have to work on a strong cooperation with the court and uh, among state parties. Not to speak about the Security Council. One interesting feature is that even in those cases that were referred to, by, uh, to the court by the Security Council, like, for example, the Darfur situation in 2005, the council has not really followed on and has not really enforced its own mandate. And these, I think, will be issues as long as the international community is not uh, ready to give a police force to this institution. And I think we can wait for a moment until that will happen. <laughs> um, we will have to find solutions for this. And I think it's a crucial weakness or shortfall. And the, the third one, and of course, Kim is in a much better position 
to speak about this is the length of proceedings. In my view, and I, if you allow me, I think the court was precipitated a little bit into the first cases. I remember I started in uh, June 2003 um, on the same day as the first prosecutor on the, uh, of the court, and a month later, he already announced the first situation of the court. And that put us under tremendous pressure. We were still, I was staff member 33, and we were still building up the court, and a month later we already had a case. And if you allow me the judgment, I think it led to some weak prosecution cases at the beginning, and that has haunted the court also uh, a bit um, afterwards. And the second point is that uh, there is a, and I, would like to see how you react to that. But we had a hope when negotiating the statute that the procedures would be lighter. And um, if you look, we introduced this new idea of pre-trial and trial, as you know, before it, there was a trial phase and the appeals phase. So we invented uh, this new phase. And I don't think it really fulfilled our expectations in the sense that the pre-trial phase does take a certain time, and then in the trial phase, some of these issues. The pre-trial should have been a filter to really uh, decide on the fundamental issues, and then the uh, trial would really uh, concentrate on guilt, on, on the person. And that has not worked. Uh, in the trial phase, we have, in my view, too many questions that should have been dealt with in the pre-trial phase. And I do hope that we find ways to uh, address this and cope with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valentin and Cecile. So I really agree with, with what has been said. I'll maybe just add a few points. Um, first, while really agreeing on the question of the limited jurisdiction, I'd like to add that I mean, the obvious limits that are set in the statute also, and, you know, including by those that are state parties and not, and therefore creating a very difficult patchwork, which is not making the jurisdiction of the court easily understandable by people. I mean, how do you understand that, for instance, in the same, on the territory of the same country, some individuals, depending on the nationality, may fall within the jurisdiction of the courts and others will not. I mean, these are complex issues that even lawyers take time to really understand. So it really impacts the visibility, negatively the visibility of, of the court and, and, and lessen the understanding of the limits that it has. So I think it's a, it's a real issue. But also on the limited jurisdiction, I, I deplore really the fact that um, in the statute we do not have um, jurisdiction of our corporate responsibility. It's extremely important to have responsibility assigned at the individual level for the reasons that, that you mentioned, Valentin, earlier. But there is also, we're also in a world where corporate entities also play a crucial role in the commission of crimes, including international crimes. And there was possibly a window of opportunity um, that we had back in 1998, which we probably would not have now and will not have for a long time. And it's a pity, really, that we don't have a jurisdiction of the court extending of our corporate uh, accountability. Now, moving more into what the court does and, and much more the challenges in the performance of its role, um, I think that there is one aspect that has not been mentioned yet, which is, I think, important, and it has to do with the interpretation of the gravity threshold. How does the court really interpret how, you know, what, what are the positions of the prosecutors and, and then of the pretrial chambers on what is the gravity threshold that make a case um, acceptable and admissible before the court. And, and that could be discussed at length, but I think that's a weak point currently, which may be remedied through uh, further jurisprudential development, but I think it creates a, a bit of a, of a challenge for the court. And, and a, a last challenge um, is also um, has to do with the prosecution policy, and in particular, how does the court and how does its prosecutor in particular calibrate the charges? Uh, back to the first cases such as Lubanga, the, case, the, the court was really criticized, including by victims, because the set of charges that had been retained was very narrow and exclusively looking at, at for instance, the recruitment and use of children in hostilities. And some of the victims' communities in the Democratic Republic of the Congo were saying, but what about the crimes committed by these children themselves? You know, that they were recruited indeed, but then they went and, and they committed terrible crimes. And what about other crimes that are also extremely grave and that for us in our community feel extremely grave and have not been prosecuted by, by the court? 
the ICC, like any other international court, has to constantly find the right balance between having a large enough um, prosecution sheets that really encompass enough charges, yet at the same time balance that with you know, the effective and efficient use of resources, which means that it cannot do it all. But in every single case and in every single situation, this is an issue. And it also leads to challenges in terms of perceptions by different people on the ground and victims' communities as to seeing sometimes the court as being one-sided. So it's also a very important challenge for the court. You know, the way it is being perceived, we, we probably come to that, but the question of the perception by the victims' communities and by the communities at large is, is a real issue for the court, I think. May I just add one? I was traveling uh, a few, uh, two years ago in Bunia, in, in the Turi region where Thomas Lubanka comes from. And it's exactly the point you made. The people said, well, the guy may have recruited children, but he killed our families. And there was no mention of that in the proceedings. And it was interesting to see that this really disappointed them to the extent that they said, look, in, in the end, it really brought us the closure that we were looking for, because it was so targeted that the real crime, the real um, wound in the community has not been healed. And it's, I think it's an important point. Thank you. I want, I want to make sure that all of you can also in, intervene exactly in the way you in, in the way you did and, and, and interact. Now we'll I think we'll we'll take these shortfalls as, as challenges and, and how to address how to address them. And um, I mean, Kim, it just happens that it's your turn too. You can select those ones that you want to address as a priority. It'd be impossible to, to cover all of them, but uh, just a few words on some of them. Um, I'll start with the uh, the judicial and then go back to some of the big picture um, and just responding to to something you said, uh, Valentin. Um, it's a bit ironic that the criticism of uh, the, one of the criticisms of the former prosecutor was he moved too fast. And the criticism you hear today of uh, Madam Prosecutor is she's not moving fast enough. Uh, so that's just to emphasize uh, that this whole area of the investigation of the crimes, which I'm not going to talk about in length, but this is a very difficult job. And this is a hugely, the issues you raise, this is a very complex um, balance that has to be struck. And uh, the president, my, the president, the former president of the court, when she was once asked about, she was said, someone said to her, your job is very, very, very difficult. She says, my job is difficult, but the prosecutor's job is impossible. Um, so I think, you know, just in bearing in mind how we face these challenges, uh, there needs to be criticism of the court and of the prosecutor, but there needs to also be support and, and ideas and innovation. And I, I address that to also academics who may be present. Uh, it's one thing just to criticize. It's another to also come up with ideas of how this balance I is achieved. Uh, talking about the judiciary, um, Okay, there's been a few glitches in this pretrial trial business. Uh, I acknowledge that. Um, one of the major changes uh, and really important initiatives of the previous presidency was to focus on trying to get agreement amongst the judges on exactly this issue. What, what is the pretrial chamber going to do? What is the trial chamber going to do? And they have adopted a manual in which some of these principles are now set out. And we have seen in situations <coughs> that cutting of the time period between the confirmation of charges to the actual start of trial by half in, in, the, in the case. Be, and I think largely due to the division of responsibilities and elimination of repetition. But unquestionably, we've got a long way to go in doing that with other procedures. And that's, what, that's the, the, one of the big challenges for the judiciary, where you're not just judges sitting on cases. We must be institution building. And we must be able to come to compromises on our procedures. And we are going to have to agree on procedures. We can't continue to have a free-for-all in every single case, how you call the evidence, how you, whether you have witness proofing, you don't have witness proofing. Yes, the statute leaves it open to do a variety of things, but, but this inconsistency is causing credibility problems, it's causing delays, and we cannot continue to have a fight between the common law and the civil law. Uh, and it's endless. It was at ICTY, it's at ICC. It has to be about drawing from both systems to find the best solutions for this hybrid court. That is a big challenge uh, for us in the judiciary. And making the reparation system work practically speaking. That's, it, it's so important to the, to the Rome statute system, but implementing reparations is a very difficult challenge. So 
Uh, just a few words on some of the big picture challenges. Um, jurisdiction, we have to continue uh, to try and, and gain more parties to the Rome Statute. And I think there are obviously states that are openly hostile. Our strategies with them might have to be a bit different. But one of the biggest challenges is simply proving to other states why the court is relevant. And that's where we need everyone to be talking about the court and why it's relevant, some of the things we've talked about today, uh, to answer that jurisdiction challenge. So I just throw that out there. Uh, I, did, I have to mention the cooperation regime, and, and Valentin, you've already spoken about it. A couple of the assumptions we made that have proven to be true, we thought that states' parties to the Rome Statute would be concerned about fellow states' parties not cooperating. Apparently, that's not the case so far. They have cooperation facilitations and non-cooperation facilitations, and they never talk about the non-cooperation cases. So I say it's states parties. The court is doing what it can, but states parties to the Rome Statute have to take cooperation seriously. Uh, and secondly, the Security Council. And the, you know, it's astonishing to me. The council seems to think that the fact that they don't follow up on their own resolutions is a problem for the credibility of the court. What we have to continue to point out to the Security Council is it's a problem of their credibility when they let their resolutions sit unachieved. So that messaging, I think, has to go in order to, and I, I love dealing with the Security Council, which I had to do for five years as ombudsperson, so I'm happy to go and tell them that, but you know, <laughs> they don't really listen to me necessarily. Um, and then lastly, I, I would just highlight this whole um, uh, question of uh, capacity building and complementarity. Um, where is the United Nations, I've been asking this question on my speaking tour lately, where is the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime? Why isn't there a program on international criminal justice at the, uh, the UN's crime office where I used to work? Um, and to the states who are attacking the court, who are hostile to the court, um, some of the big powers, I think we have to be going back to them on this principle of complementarity and saying, yes, you don't like the court doing these prosecutions? OK, fine. Then you find a justice solution. You help states build their national capacity so we have a justice answer because you say you believe in justice. You're just not a supporter of the court. We have to be more aggressive, in my view, in dealing, in dealing with those who just challenge the court and don't address the justice question. Thank you. I, I will just mention one which is also linked to the UN Security Council and it is not only to have the Security Council follow up on cases but also to be more systematic in the way it refers cases and, and sees the, the court. It is a challenge for an international criminal court to um, be seen as something that is obviously at the receiving end of political decisions. That's unfortunately the, the state of, uh, of the game but it doesn't mean that it's not a real challenge that not only face the Security Council, but also the court because of, of the perception. So a more systematic, more systematic referrals by the UN Security Council, a stronger commitment on the part of the Security Council, and, and hopefully, in fact, um, the fact that the Security Council could uh, come up with an initiative that was notably supported by Switzerland, which is to really commit not to use the veto in circumstances where international crimes are being committed, something that, uh, that in fact, uh, France has also been pushing and that the High Commission for Human Rights has been um, really repeating publicly, that would really uh, create, um, you know, that's a massive challenge, I think, for the court. There are others. Benjamin. To add on what's uh, been said uh, already, and once again, coming from the perspective of uh, uh, the, the ICRC, because we, we try to work on uh, addressing these, uh, the, the, these challenges, uh, I, I would mention um, the overall issue of universal acceptance of the Rome Statute remains something that needs to be worked on. Um, uh, voilà. More states need to consider uh, their uh, adherence to the to the Rome Statute, namely because of the point that I uh, made before, because of the the, in the incentive that uh, it, it gave it, it gives uh, to the international community to take up the issue uh, and, and 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 work uh, on, on it. And I can speak. Uh, I'm mentioning this point because. In, in, in whole humility somehow, I mean, this is a point that we advocate for at uh, the ICRC uh, uh, level with uh, states, so we're pretty familiar with, uh, with, with this. The, the second, very briefly, uh, in, in, in addition to what uh, uh, Kim said, in terms of ensuring that indeed the system uh, allows for better cooperation uh, f by states with the court, 
I'd say you could, you could even go a, a bit further and, and mention uh, the need for, the, for states to, to better grasp their first responsibility, to be the first in line, to be the first responders. I mean, very, way, way often we, we, we hear um, comments about the ICC that gives the impression that indeed there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of explaining the system. The system is that if there is impunity, it's probably because there is a failure from states first, then the ICC somehow, if you look at, the, at, at how the, the state is designed. So there is work to be done on, on, on that aspect to get rid of the perception that the ICC is something more than basically the tip of the iceberg, which it somehow is. I'm not going to focus on the, on the last two questions. I would like to come to, uh, to come to some of the well, some of the aspects that uh, that you mentioned. At least, well, capacity building. I always th thought that with the winding down of ICTY, ICTR, there would be a number of people who would be more than happy to work. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and for instance, I remember discussions with uh, UNDP or the World Bank. How long it, it took for these institutions to consider that the rule of law and including the fight, uh, uh, well, in favor of accountability was also pretty much part of rule of law efforts and, and, and of development. So uh, these institutions, I mean, had to be involved. And uh, according to my understanding, they have started doing this, but I don't know to, to what extent they have done it. But then, Kim, you, you uh, stimulated my curiosity when you mentioned immunities and said that you might say a few things about it. So, I mean, it's, it's a temptation that I don't resist. Yeah. Well, just a little bit, because obviously one of the, the issues in the cooperation context, and you've alluded to it, Valentin, is the whole interplay between the Article 98 of the Rome Statute, which um, allows for recognition of immunities in certain situations, and Article 27, which uh, you know eliminates the use of them uh, in terms of any kind of precluding of, uh, of um, proceedings. And um, what I would want to say, as I say, the, the, the appeals chamber of the ICC, if you're not aware, is considering a case right now arising from the visit of President Al-Bashir to uh, Jordan and has invited, which I think is a very good thing, invited uh, submissions from public international law um, experts on this whole question of the interplay. Um, but one of the things I can say, because I've written on this, having been a part of Part 9 uh, and the development of Article 98, one of the remarkable things to me is that this was never how, and this, you know, this happens a lot with legislation, uh, this was never how Article 98 was even envisaged to operate at all. Th this was a room full of cooperation geeks mutual legal systems, extradition geeks. And our focus was on what happens if you get an, a, a request from the court to search a diplomatic premise. Or what happens if you're in the middle of a summit, in the middle of a summit, and the ICC dramatically unveils <coughs> an arrest warrant for a sitting head of state? What do you do in that situation? And the whole concept of creating your own situations of conflict between these obligations never crossed our minds. And I, I, so part of the problem is, I think, trying to place these, these texts and these provisions into a, a practical context that's workable. And, and, um, and this is a huge issue because it's an issue of credibility for the court. And it's an issue of uh, the effectiveness of the court's warrant. So we'll see. As I say, it's before the appeals chamber. I'm very hopeful that, at the very least, this will be a very considered decision with lots of impact, input on these larger uh, public international law questions. But it is just an, uh, one of the examples of how what was envisaged has, in practical terms, been a very different uh, scenario. Thank you very much. With, with that, the time have, has come for, for the question. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. Um, I was just a bit puzzled that uh, our four speakers here mentioned the uh, very existence of ICC as its, main, um, as, its, as its main success, because for me, I see it more as a mean than an end in itself. So I guess my question is, that's it? <laughs> and uh, maybe could you give us um, a case, an exemplary case that you find very successful? Uh, I agree with you. It's the, the way to formulate it. When, at least I said, and I think that we all understood it that way, 
It's the existence of these institutions has been a change of paradigm. It is the recognition of the importance of accountability on the international level. And um, as I mentioned, as a tool to contribute to prevention of conflicts, as a tool to really go at the individuals, but it's the very fact that it was possible to come on the basis of a consensus to this conclusion. Uh, we all mentioned the history, how long it took. The first proposal for an international criminal court, and it's perhaps worth mentioning here, came from one of the founding mem uh, members of the ICRC, Gustave Moignier, who proposed an international criminal court in these terms in 1875. And it was never possible, and everybody dreamed, uh, uh, called it a, a, a utopian uh, dream. And even in the 90s, when we had the first two ad hoc, the idea that responsible people, politicians, war, um, how do you say, war, uh, war people, would ever be brought to justice was called a totally unrealistic as assumption. And this changed from one day to the other with the adoption of the Rome Statute that was treaty-based. And today, we should not forget, it wasn't mentioned yet, we have two-thirds of all countries that have ratified the statute. So it is, in, that, in these terms, it is a huge success. I agree with you that it's a tool rather than a success, but in itself, that was the, the sea change. And in my view, it's not going to go away, and this is why it is so important. If I could just add to that, that's a, that's a great question coming from the youth of uh, uh, the, the next generation um, because um, it demonstrates that I had this experience when I was in New York and I was describing to a young political officer the experience of Rome and the drama of that night and he said, you know, that's so remarkable because for me, exactly what you said, the ICC is a given. So I think we all put emphasis on it because it, it, it is there and, and I like to hear people that confident about it, but it's really fragile. And so that's why its success must be championed because it must be protected. But you asked for a good example, and one case that I would use as an example that has effects both for individual responsibility but also more broadly is the Almaki case, uh, the cultural property case uh, that was completed by what, you know, it was a guilty plea, uh, which is also using a different part of the Rome Statute, but also it brought to the forefront the importance of the protection of cultural property, in, and we see a lot of horrific crime in that area in a lot of conflicts uh, and that was an important um, precedent for, for a number of reasons. So we have incrementally successes in terms of different aspects. Lots of challenges but I, I think it, the, the point is that as the case law expands and as the responsibility um, increases that, that that will build on the success but we're starting with this first steps and then we're, we're now entering the stage of it's got to be more precise and more specific instances. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm Diego Ruiz from the Mission of Mexico. I had the privilege a few years ago of being a student of Professor Michel at the Graduate Institute when the responsibility to protect was a very new and exciting topic. So it's a pleasure to see you back again. Um, I have one question related to, uh, to the achievements of the court in terms of uh, prevention. Um, I think by definition, measuring what is prevented is very complicated because it is not there and it's, uh, it's difficult to, to identify. But I'd like to, to know um, to what extent do you think that the court has uh, fulfilled the, uh, um, the subjective of preventing mass atrocities by the other proceedings that uh, the court has, uh, has taken? And then my second point would be if you could elaborate on the links between the court and uh, the humanitarian and, and human rights organisms that are based in Geneva. Um, and I think uh, in particular of the work of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the outcomes of the uh, Human Rights Council in terms of commission of inquiries and in terms of resolutions that are address country-specific uh, country situations in which the council requests uh, the situation to be referred to, to the court. I'm Reza, the person in charge of the IHL in Iran, Mishir, in, in Geneva. I have two questions. Uh, the first one with regard to the limited jurisdiction which has been highlighted by some panelists. Uh, I need more elaboration on what you really mean by that. Are you of the view that you need more accession by a state to the Roma statue or you think that 
some and or more crimes should fall under the, the mandates and the jurisdictions of the of the of the court. And my second question, with regard to the achievement of the court, uh, relates to the, the 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 contribution and the role of the court in development and also in promotion of IHL or international criminal law. Would you specify some examples? of how the court contributed to the development of these fields of international law. Thank you. The, the first question on, um, on prevention, on the expectations, whether they were uh, fulfilled, and um, the links between uh, the court and uh, humanitarian human rights institutions here in, uh, in Geneva, on, on prevention expectations. As you say, it's very different, uh, difficult to measure. What uh, we knew when I was at the court that in certain situations that were um, coming into the ambit or were under scrutiny by the court, we had clear indications that the people were much more um, uh, cautious in what they were doing. Some hired uh, lawyers to uh, advise them. Uh, others um, changed their tactics because they knew they will be scrutinized by the court. Second indication, uh, we know that many countries, and I don't think it's a secret, the United States uh, who oppose the, the court, they have adapted their military manuals according to the statute of, the, uh, of Rome. So you do see indications, but it all relies on the credibility of the institution. And this is why it is so important to continue to really fight, so to speak, or to, to strive for a legitimacy, uh, the legitimacy of the institution with uh, high quality judgment, high quality people, and efficient uh, proceedings. And second, and it was mentioned, and I come to the other question, universality, um, second, to have as many countries on board as possible to counter this impression of uh, double standards. You ask what we meant by uh, mentioning uh, the jurisdiction, the limited jurisdiction. Certainly it's about the countries, but it's also about the law. And it has been mentioned by Benjamin. We have differences, for example, between international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict. I think we should continue to work on that. Some <coughs> crimes were already added. Switzerland at the moment is uh, advocating the inclusion of an additional crime in NIAX, non-international uh, armed conflict. I do not know how you say technically inducing um, hunger as a weapon of war. How would... Sorry? Starvation. Okay. So we starvation have as starvation a as a method of war, uh, warfare. So we have to continue to really, and it's all the goal is to establish the legitimacy and the credibility of the court, because it will only work uh, if we can achieve that goal. On the uh, just perhaps yeah. one, there was one question about the development of international humanitarian law, and this also comes to your point about the successes. And Kim has indicated uh, on cultural uh, property, but if you look, there are many um, other. Uh, um, issues where international law has been uh, developed by the International uh, Criminal Court. You take, for example, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, I remember in the negotiations when we tried to take into account the existing jurisprudence in formulating the elements of crimes, and since then there were additional um, uh, developments, and I think we know today much more of uh, as, uh, se sexual and gender-based violence as a means of warfare than we did only 20 years ago. And today we have the tools to also respond to it. That, if you look at the classical instruments, the Geneva Convention also, you won't find any trace of it. So this is an extremely important uh, development. You take child recruitment, uh, we have different instruments, but today it is a crime under the um, uh, Rome Statute, and we have cases. So there was a development over time, which is more of perhaps of a technical uh, nature, but nevertheless extremely important. If I could just add, just very briefly, I mean, I think the other thing is um, that we, we, we are still at a relatively early stage in terms of the development of, of the law, and in, therefore in terms also of the preventative effects, because, you know, we just have the cases, and the cases have to go, th you know, through various phases of what, where these principles are dealt with. Um, in the appeals phase, for example, uh, uh, there could be different, different developments. So, 
you know, it's still, I know it's, it's a bit, of, it's a long time in some contexts, but it's also a short period of time when you look at the whole history of IHL. So I think the court needs to be given more time to, to continue to make contributions towards its development. And then one other thing, again, the Madam Prosecutor's challenge on prevention, her use of the preliminary examination process, you know, and she's criticized whatever she does uh, by revealing and being very transparent about where she is going in, there is a hope that that will help in terms of prevention. But at the same time, we've seen recently the opening of the investigation or her uh, preliminary examination in relation to the Philippines results in a, in a withdrawal. Um, so again, trying to prevent, but at the same time, uh, trying to be effective and maintain jurisdiction. Uh, again, balances that have to be struck. So, so we still have part of the questions on the institutions here in Geneva. Uh, Cecile? The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights um, very openly supports the universal ratification of the, of the Rome Statute. So there have been several calls, in fact, for the universal ratification, um, which really is in line with then um, the, the um, other um, question, which was really what do we mean by the limited jurisdiction? I think that um, many of us alluded to the fact that because the ICC does not have a jurisdiction that is universal, there are gaps in that jurisdiction. And that that creates to then some of the challenges in the court being attacked for being selective. So, um, you know, the universal jurisdiction would really mean that there is a universal reach and that therefore there are no situations escaping um, the competence of, of the court. Not only does the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights advocate for the universal ratification, but in fact states um, as part of the universal periodic review have also very frequently called for uh, ratification. Um, so when states that are non state party to the Rome Statute comes before UPR, um, there have been very frequent recommendations calling on them to ratify the Rome Statute. And then for those that are state party, to then also um, uh, have a negotiated agreement with the court, memorandum of understanding. So there is there are a number of recommendations made by states to other states um, as part of the universal periodic review. And um, both special procedure um, as well as treaty bodies have also called um, frequently for ratification of the Rome Statute. The special rapporteur on torture, for instance, has been making that call indicating that because torture uh, and the Convention Against Torture does advocate for universal jurisdiction, it would really help if states were really to implement their obligations under the Convention Against Torture, but also uh, ratify the Rome Statute. So there are, there are many, in fact, uh, links, and that's just looking at, at OHHR. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Okay, a, a very quick word on uh, the, the prevention aspect uh, without going into the details. I believe that uh, if you look genuinely at the system, what probably will have a, a, a true and genuine impact on preventing the commission of uh, uh, war crimes is if the system works at domestic level. This is where the bulk of the cases will or should happen. And, and, and if, if perpetrators see that, okay, well, the, they, they have a chance to end up before a national court, uh, this might have a, a strong uh, in, impact. Um, clarification of IHL, uh, I totally agree. I mean, I, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the, of the Rome Statute, but uh, let's be honest, uh, we're celebrating probably 10 years of judicial practice, which is extremely short in the grand scheme of, uh, of things, so it's a process in the in the making, uh, definitely, which does not mean that uh, there is no, there, there's nothing done uh, yet. Um, uh, just to give you a, a, an illustration, um, the, the, both the statute of the of the ICC, but also a number of uh, uh, courts' decision are have been referenced in the updated commentaries to the Geneva Conventions uh, already. So there is a we the, the ICRC has taken note already of a number of. Uh, um, you know, achievements or points made by the by the court so far, and then I don't know if I need to expand on the relationship between the ICRC and the and the ICC. But uh, uh, just to clarify the, the 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 situation, so as I said, overall from a macro perspective, same as uh, uh, human rights bodies, we support the the ICC in its uh, in its effort. We do not participate in any way into in individual cases. Nevertheless, we are um, very interested, let's say, in sharing our uh, expertise 
decontextualized uh, on IHL. And for a number of, uh, of reasons, one of them is that we're very interested in, in having the court not only listening to our opinion, but possibly abiding by the, the views of the ICRC on a number of uh, on a number of issues. So we do engage with the with the ICC and all organs of the courts actually uh, on technical IHL related issues. A case that comes to mind and that was in the media last week is of course the case that has been submitted by the Palestinian Authority, and I wanted to hear your views on in terms of the jurisdiction issues that you've raised. Um, how likely is the ICC going to handle that case? Because I just looked at the website of the prosecutor that basically already in 2015 uh, a case was submitted. And so maybe you have uh, more views on the challenges in the handling of that case by the ICC. We would be interested to hear, given that it's a very um, recent case that was submitted. Thank you. Could I invite you kindly to say your name? Yeah, Joachim Nason. Thank you. Your neighbor? I'm Gerd Teilinger from the Austrian mission here in Geneva. Uh, and I would also um, would like to, again, to congratulate to, to, to that event because for us and Austria is a staunch and long uh, standing support of, of, of the court. It's important to highlight the successes. Uh, and, and as you have done with also reference to cases, to other achievements uh, in the meantime, like the activization of the crime of aggression, uh, also to better explain to the public uh, the work and the added value and the importance of the of the existence of the court. And and my question in that case would be, uh, and also because my neighbour mentioned mentioned the media, uh, I think that more that more. Uh, back more, uh, not, not on a specific case, but more in general, does the ICC, the court, or also maybe its state parties need to do more on public outreach, communications, better explaining to the, both the media, which has an important role to play, and uh, the public from uh, school education up to, to universities, of course, and there are many academics here, and, and, and the graduate ac uh, uh, academy, is, uh, the Geneva Academy is an excellent institution for that, to, to do more on that, to, to enhance capacities on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam. And my question was uh, specific, but maybe already some of the panelists touched upon upon it. It was when uh, the Monsieur, the Conseiller Juridique of the ICRC, you mentioned among the shortfall the, f the fact that uh, Article 8 uh, regarding war crimes were not uh, maybe as comprehensive as we could uh, expect, and I just wanted wanted if you had uh, an example to develop a bit, but. Okay, I, I, um, it was also interesting to hear from Ambassador Zellweger regarding the different uh, new kind of crimes that are taken into account. Thank you. My name is Ariane and I'm from Pro Victimist Foundation. I have a question because you mentioned uh, one of the purpose, the added value of the ICC was prevention and also catalyst uh, role for the uh, responsibility of the states. In the 20 years of its existence, do you have any examples whereby the works of the ICC has contributed in consolidating a judicial system of a f uh, former failing uh, state? Thank you. Thank you. Well, at this point, there is some discussion at the level of African Union to create an African criminal court. Uh, you, from the point of view of ICC, do you see it as a challenge, as a threat, as an opportunity? Thank you. Who wants to pick some of the questions? I'm not going to organize it too strictly because I want you to be able to address the issues that you want to talk. I will take the one on communication. Uh, certainly, there is a need for outreach and communication. The court is already doing a lot, but as we have said, to really strengthen the importance of accountability, also as a tool of prevention, I think we have to talk more about it. It's not only about the court, it's also about us. You mentioned that Austria is a country that really supports the court. I think all those that support the court will have to continue speaking about the court and its, its uh, merits. Um, in this whole discussion that we have at the moment on prevention within the United Nations system, I think there is space 
to speak more about criminal uh, justice, about human rights, etc. So we should all work on that, but certainly there is a, a, a need. There was a discussion at the court, and Kim can certainly update us. The court also considered at one stage to go what they called in situ, to have the trials in uh, the area where they are, because that certainly is one of the challenges that it's seen as this institution high up north where there is no link. The court has gone out of its way to communicate its proceedings with uh, community-based television, television centers and all of that. But perhaps that is an idea that is worth coming back to, although it's extremely complicated and complex. So it's not as easy as it sounds. I saw, in, I mentioned I was in Ituri, I saw the compound of the ICC, which was so highly secured that it did not really uh, fulfill this image of an, uh, you know, uh, of an accessible uh, court. Then there was a question on the African court. Um, I don't think, in my view, and I only speak for myself, I think that could be a very helpful or uh, worthy addition to the whole system of accountability. Um, the ICC will never be able to take on but a few cases per situation. And there is an expectation, and we haven't spoken about the expectation management, but there was a huge expectation uh, in 98, certainly, that uh, there would now be, <coughs> this court would cover the whole world. It's not in a position to do that. So complementarity has an important role to play, but there may be a layer in between where we all know that national proceedings, as important as they are, they don't always work for different reasons, um, but um, there are political implications that may make them very difficult. So to have a regional court, uh, in my view, could be an addition to the whole system. But of course we would have to look at it, how exactly it fits into the system and what its uh, jurisdiction is. But certainly not to say um, this is like a competition or uh, something that we should... Um, the most important, again, is the idea of accountability. And there I'd like to come to this one question on whether the court has uh, encouraged consolidating uh, judicial systems in, uh, uh, in fragile uh, environments. And of course that is a, a difficult question, but there are indications that it that it did indeed. Uh, for example, the DRC. In the DRC today, there are criminal cases uh, in, in uh, war crime, on war crimes that were not deemed to be feasible 20 years ago. So there was a strengthening of the local judicial system. And that, of course, is the, um, the, one of the challenges. And just a, one, a last remark, because Nicola alluded to it, the cooperation between um, the court and act actors such as UNDP or other development actors, that of course is a difficult relationship or cooperation, and I think we will have to learn more about it, because the court must follow judicial um, uh, you know, indications. The court cannot cooperate with an, an institution and say, okay, we could target this country and then work together. You strengthen the system or we take the cases. So it's up to the court and then to find new ways of cooperation with different development actors to really strengthen the systems. But also that we are at the beginning and we should not forget the point was made. It's only 20 years that we have the court. And Perhaps in 10 years, things will look very differently. It all depends on how um, the international politics will develop. And thank you, Valentin, and thank you for mentioning also the, uh, the issue of uh, UNDP and, uh, and the World Bank. It's obviously not for the court to uh, establish a cooperation with these agencies, but it, it, for the UN in general or for states, etc., to convince them that that's part of their roles. It, um, I would echo the, the point on communication. It's a really big priority for the court. We have taken some initiatives, such as the opening of the Ongwin trial. Uh, we broadcast the opening of it, and the registrar was in northern Uganda for that. So, and the Ongwin uh, chamber is about to do a, a visit, but it's a, not an in situ, it's a site visit. But uh, we need help. Um, this is something we need help with communication plans. We need help with spreading the word about the court. So that's a hugely important point. 
uh, biggest fallacy is the suggestion that we see any court that's uh, dealing with these cases as any kind of competition. We welcome that. We need that. Uh, we need alternative forms of justice. We need, and the Africa court has great potential. There's obviously some issues about whether it meets the complementarity on a certain area, but every initiative that's designed to bring an end to impunity and to address these crimes, it is extremely welcomed by this court. And I'll echo what the first prosecutor said if we never had a case, the court would be a great success. So um, absolutely uh, the case. And I do want to say um, it is very difficult to tell um, the effect of the court in terms of uh, the uh, legal impact on states. But we do have some concrete examples of where the court's work improves the legal systems. Implementation. Many states have implemented the crimes as a result of becoming states' parties to the Rome Statute. And I've seen remarkable, there's a very sophisticated um, international cooperation system in the DRC now that's better than a lot of European systems for cooperation. It's a result of the, the request for assistance that have gone back and forth. So I'll, I'll leave it there since I had one minute I went a little over. Thank you. No, <laughs> I mean, it's wonderful that, that there are many questions that you're interested in. Would you say a final word? Very, very briefly, on, still on, that, on the issues of building capacity. I mean, examples, very specific examples include Uganda where a special court was actually really established and has been taking up some cases for, for um, international, you know, based on international crimes, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Colombia, where the, the, the system has also really been working, and um, not, not, last but not least, the Central African Republic, where there is also a special court that has been established that also has competence over, over international crimes. So this is not to say that, that, you know, those criminal justice systems are necessarily perfect. There is, you know, I mean, really only a situation where they would be able absolutely no immunity would be one uh, of perfections and in fact no court, no criminal court in the world actually man manages that. But just, uh, I mean, one word on, on the question of the media also because I think it goes back to what is for me one of the crucial and essential elements of, of the ICC, which is that it is a piece as part of a broader system, and we need to make sure that this is not a piece that is just seen as a keystone that is not sufficiently supported by other mechanisms. What comes to my mind very often when thinking of the ICC was a, a lady, a victim herself of rape, whose two daughters had also been raped, and her husband had, her husband had actually been killed in the same process, in the same incident. That was in the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo. And she was part of a training on the ICC, and we were explaining the limit of the jurisdiction of the ICC. And this lady really, and she was not actually you know, trying to be mean or vicious in any way, but she says, so if I understand what you say, my case, the fact that I was raped, that my teenager daughters were raped, and their fathers were killed in front of their eyes, that case is not grave enough for the ICC to take it. Because the perpetrators were not responsible enough in terms of the chain of hierarchy. And answering that question, there is the very basic legal answer that we can give. But then there is the actual real justice answer that we collectively should give to this victim. And I think it goes to essentially then making a much better job at explaining what is the court, what are the limits, but also setting up a much broader system that will have far less gaps <coughs> and where we're not going to fail victims such as this lady. Thank you. In a few words, I won't have time to, to elaborate, but I would say that there is still work uh, on, on two aspects in relation to harmonizing our uh, Article 8 with uh, the current state, at least in the SCRC's view, um, with the customary international humanitarian law. So we, that's the first angle. So the, the list of war crimes according to uh, our study on customary international humanitarian law is not completely reflected as a whole in uh, common article uh, in not common article eight. You see the <laughs> in, in article eight, but there are also uh, discrep important discrepancies to address between war crimes in arm in international armed conflict and non inter And we listed just one. There are many, uh, but the fact that indeed starvation as a mean of warfare is not yet criminalized as such in NIAC does objectively does not make mm, a lot of sense in terms of humanitarian uh, purposes. Um, voilà, so uh, we could give you a, a full list of, uh, of, uh, of the provisions that we, we could consider including, but uh, as, as a matter of wrapping uh, things up, I just want to uh, say one more time that indeed we're celebrating the 20th anniversary, nevertheless it's a very 
young process yet. It's still very much in the making. Uh, and the role that the Rome Statute has been playing uh, for the past 20 years and is still continuing to play uh, in terms of inciting those who are responsible to, to, to take action, namely the states, um, must necessarily uh, be continued to be, to be supported. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's one of the, 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 challenge, uh, the challenges uh, ahead. Um, and I hope that we will be able to take stock of that uh, in 10 years when we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Rome Statute here, hopefully, if the room has not been booked by, uh, by someone else. Thank you. So thank, thank you so much, Madame, for these concluding uh, words. But I'm sure that you share with me um, the uh, gratitude that I want to express to, to the panelists that were, who were really uh, remarkable, very stimulating. So thank you very much.